Hello and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today we're looking at the 2023 to 2024 series Dead by Daylight. For those who may not be aware, Dead by Daylight is an asymmetric online multiplayer video game that's a love letter to all things horror, where one person plays as a murderous supernatural killer attempting to eliminate the other four players. Those players, as mostly regular human survivors, attempt to fix five generators, dodge the killer, and then escape through one of the two exit gates, because failing means being sacrificed to the endlessly hungry and mysterious entity. The creature that has trapped all these people in its realm and forced them to play out this sick scenario over and over again. DVD came out on Steam in 2016, but has since moved to all major platforms, and they even created a mobile version in 2020. The game has only continued to explode in popularity from there, leading to a dating sim spin-off, a standalone story-focused game, and even an officially licensed board game. It's honestly a pretty good board game. Thumbs up would recommend. And on top of all that, there would also be this four issue comic book series focused on the Legion. Of the various killers you can play as in the game, few have captured the public's attention as much as the Legion, a killer that is actually four different people. And you can play as any one of them at a time, choosing between Frank, Julie, Joey, or obviously best girl Susie. I will not be hearing arguments at this time. I like the Legion so much, I actually put together an outfit to go as the Legion for Halloween a couple years ago. I even painted the face mask myself. Tesla was not impressed. She's a tough critic. Because yes, I'm a big fan of the game. I've been practically obsessed with it since I started playing back in January 2018. I can almost guarantee that pretty much every video on this channel had at least part of the work for it done during the wait between matches, which used to be a lot easier to do when wait times were a lot longer. So thanks a lot for fixing your game behavior. Jeez. All this is to say that I was very excited when a Dead by Daylight comic was announced, especially since it would provide a backstory for the psychopathic teenage pals that comprise these The Strangers knockoffs. I was so excited about it that I framed up each issue on my wall at work, with all the good Marvel zombies as well. The comic would be written by Nadia Shamus, award-winning author of the YA comic Squire, and drawn by relative newcomer Dylan Snook, whose name appropriately sounds like it would be the onomatopoeia for the Legion missing their knife swing. Can these fresh faces deliver us a darkly murderous monster of a story? Let's find out and take this away. The comic opens on some murder, murder, murder. Looks like the Frank version of Legion is in Ormond, the small town that will be our setting for this story, and is already plenty busy racking up our kill count. But don't start tallying just yet, cause Frank dressed in civvies is also here somehow, and the two Franks start a staring contest. As the entity and the fog start closing in, Legion Frank hands off his switchblade, not his trademark combat knife, to regular Frank before regular Frank has a rude awakening, quite literally. Teenage Frank is being woken from his wet with blood dream by his new foster father, who's not given a name and has some Bluebeardian rules about his bedroom, but otherwise clearly doesn't care about being a human father. But he is a good dog father, so he can't be all bad, right? Once Frank is in the storage area that is his new bedroom, he reveals he actually has that switchblade from his dream and uses it to leave his mark on the wall. Foster Dad's probably not gonna like that, especially with it being in such a visible spot. Next, we find Julie in front of Ormond High, creeping on a couple making out and drawing them in a much more interesting position. I like where your mind's at, Jules. So does Frank, it would seem, who compliments her art and tries to get her name. Though Frank gives his last name, Morrison, we only get Julie's first name here. From the game, we know that Julie's last name is actually Kostenko, and that Susie's last name is Lavoy, leaving only Joey as just Joey. But Frank's insistence on referring to Julie as just Julie might be a reference to how only Frank's name was initially revealed. I think behavior may have worried that no one would care about the other members of the Legion. How wrong they were. Speaking of behavior, I love that Snook gave Julie almost a Chelsea cut here, with one side of her head mostly shaved off. 
Not only do I love the look, but I can't help feeling like it's a reference to how some artist at Behavior clearly loves partially shaved head hairstyles, given how just about every female head cosmetic for a while seemed to include it. And I'm saying that Snook gave Julie this haircut because, in case you're unaware, this comic is actually the first time we get to see any of the Legion without their masks on, which is enough on its own to make this comic fairly significant. Julie can immediately tell that Frank isn't from Ormond, and they bond over how lame public school is until Susie shows up looking for Julie, having grown impatient waiting for Julie so she could drive them home. Susie, who is Julie's best friend, seems much less excited about meeting Frank, but Julie still invites the new guy to a party at her house later that night. At the party, we finally get to meet Joey, showing up as late as Winston in a Ghostbusters movie. But Julie is disappointed when it's not Frank at the door. But that's because Frankie Boy snuck in through her parents' bedroom just to prove that he could. But it seems Julie likes them bad boys. Even though it's her party, it's not long before Frank asks if they want to cut out to enjoy some hard liquor. Or at least I assume it's hard liquor. I'll be honest, I don't really know shit about liquor. What is that supposed to be, whiskey? I don't know. It's high enough proof that they're all pretty shit-faced pretty quickly. That's, that's a British term for drunk, in case you're wondering. And they're so drunk that they're clearly having trouble playing their little game of truth or dare. Julie can't even think of a dare for Frank, but he uses the opportunity to get his first kiss with Julie. Pretty sure that's the only reason anyone would play truth or dare anyway. Frank then asks Susie her greatest fear, and she admits that it's that she'll one day be forgotten completely. It seems Frank has the same fear, especially after being bounced around the foster care system for so long, and that's why he carves his name everywhere he goes, in order to leave his mark. That gives Julie the idea for them all to leave their mark, which involves grabbing a bunch of paint and defacing the school. Frank finishes off their hard work by throwing a rock through a window, but that gets the cops after them. Joey has the brilliant idea to use the plates they were keeping their paint on as masks, so the cops can't identify them as they run away. They quickly lose the cops by ducking in an alleyway, then double back to steal their car. Continuing their night of mayhem, they each claim a hood ornament from a different car, which says to me this must be set in the 80s or early 90s. Not a cell phone in sight, the cars are super boxy, and when's the last time cars actually came with hood ornaments like that? They cap off crime night by burning the police car, then, as they return home, Julie gives Frank's paint plate a kiss for him to keep as a souvenir. We then shift to Julie's perspective to see she's apparently also having dreams about murder, but hers also involve her and Frank getting busy in pools of blood. Outside of those dreams, Julie seems to come from a perfectly nice suburban family with loving parents, but no matter how perfect her seemingly idyllic life, she's still into misbehaving. So when they run into Frank at school, Julie decides to skip out on class for the day to show him the Mount Ormond Resort. Susie stays behind because she's unable to risk failing her class, and because she can probably tell what the two really want, so Julie and Frank go by themselves to give us our first actual look at the chapter map. The Mount Ormond map is a very unique map in the game, with its design based around a large center area designed for looping, and notably the only map with snow. It's an abandoned ski lodge, but Julie gives us some more history to it here, saying that there is evidence of ritual animal sacrifice in the woods around the resort, in that the mountain once had a mine, but it was closed before any digging really began after 13 lives were lost down a mine shaft. Julie believes that this was a sacrifice as well, a planned human sacrifice to some entity living deep below the mountain. In fact, she's convinced that cult rituals are on the rise all across the country, and that they're all done by one group. This may be more indication that we're in that late 80s slash early 90s time period, as the satanic panic was at its peak at that time, as many people believed in bogus conspiracy theories that ritual and occult sacrifice was happening, and even on the rise, across the country. It of course wasn't, at least in reality, but this feels like it could also be intended as a subtle lore addition. Could a cult group be out there intentionally culling sites and people to be part of the entity's sick and twisted game? Is that really how everyone becomes part of Dead by Daylight? 
something to think about. Before we get to hear more about that though, Frank interrupts her chain of thought to ask what her damage is. What is it that makes her like him, despite her seemingly perfect life? She explains that that's exactly what the problem is. In this small town in the middle of nowhere, no matter how nice her life is, she'll never be anything or anyone. And the best she can hope for is getting married to a husband who's not abusive. I think you might be on the wrong track there, Julie, but, you know, that's me. Julie wants more than that. She wants to be a legend. Like Bonnie and Clyde, but not just a repeat of someone else's legend. Something new. When Julie and Frank return from their private times at the mountain, they have another friends night, this time getting together to rent videos from a video store. Yes, that's right kids, to see movies, we used to have to go to a physical store and find a movie on a shelf and rent it like a book from the library. It was different times. What I love about this is that Jeff Johansson, the survivor that came in the Legion's DLC chapter, apparently works the front counter at the video store and is even in one of their classes at school. Also, the video they rent is from the Cold Wind series, a reference to the Cold Wind farm map, home map of the chainsaw-wielding hillbilly, who gets a brief cameo as they watch the film. They even specifically reference the cowshed version of the map. Inspired by the movie, Julie wants to have another night of mayhem, but before they can, Frank's foster dad gets home and everyone is forced to flee to keep Frank from getting into too much trouble. But Julie's not done with her idea, revealing to the others that she's made them all masked, inspired by the paint plates they used on that first night. She's also shown then possibly attacking Frank's foster dad's dog, but this might also not happen? It's extremely unclear. She's shown at the same time watching a movie about a dog, and she's shown wiping the dog's blood on her mask, but the next time we see that mask, there's no blood on it. The coloring here is also similar to the coloring in the dream sequences, so the idea may be that the line between the psychotic dreams and reality are starting to blur, but we haven't quite crossed it yet. From here we switch to Joey's perspective, who also starts his story with a murderous dream. He's revealed to be the school mascot, which is apparently a beaver, but the Legion version of him kills the whole team and leaves the mascot decapitated. Joey seems to be a lot less into the murdering than Frank and Julie, especially once the entity comes bursting out of the decapitated mascot costume. As with the others, once he's awake, Joey sets about getting ready for the day, revealing that he has a tattoo now. All four of them seem to get a tattoo like some sort of group initiation. We never see Julie's tattoo, unfortunately, but Frank gets his iconic neck tattoo, and Susie gets a little purple rose on her arm as we see when they stop by the video store again later. There, Susie shows the ink off to Jeff, who seems to be pretty into her, but Frank shuts down their interaction real quick, trying to keep Susie available for Joey. Seems that they're both convinced that to complete their foursome, Joey should ask Susie out, but he's a little too hesitant. Judging from Susie's interactions with Julie earlier, I'm gonna guess she's maybe not that into either of these dudes. Though Joey doesn't seem to be that excited about hanging out with Frank, Frank seems convinced he needs to bring Joey out of his shell, saying that they need to do bigger and better things as their little group, which at some point in the past few weeks, they've taken to calling the Legion. I feel kinda robbed that we don't really get some kind of origin for that name, but oh well. Frank and Joey part ways as Joey starts working at the local corner store. When Joey finishes work for the day and goes to get his pay, his boss refuses to pay him, claiming that Joey stole a candy bar and so he's being fired instead, even after making him work all day while still not planning to pay him. The store owner is convinced that Joey is a bad egg, claiming Joey's brothers, which is the first I've heard that he has brothers, that they were just as bad, so of course Joey would turn out a criminal. Joey doesn't know it, but it was actually Frank who stole the candy bar, a Bubba Crunch, which may just be a subtle nod to Leatherface being in the game. The game calls him the cannibal, but let's be honest, everyone calls him Bubba. Just don't call him Basement Bubba. That's all besides the point though. The actual point is that it looks to me like Frank intentionally stole the candy bar to get Joey in trouble in order to push him into action. 
And it works. Enraged at his boss's bullshit, Joey declares they should hit the corner store that night, and is even susceptible to Frank and Julie pushing for more than simple vandalism. So the gang gets dressed up in their, at this point, identical masks, and break into the store to do some damage. Susie is the only one seemingly smart enough to realize they'll obviously suspect Joey first, but he doesn't care anymore. He does take this opportunity to answer a question Susie had asked him earlier about why he shaves his head. He says when he gets nervous, he plucks out his hair, so he keeps his head shaved to keep himself from doing that. What the foursome didn't expect was that someone would still be working at the store, a cleaner who grabs Julie in an effort to stop them. Interesting how she screams out Susie's name, not Frank's. Say, that's a good time to transition to our fourth issue, told from Susie's perspective. Susie's also, of course, been having murder dreams. Hers are of getting revenge on her abusive father, beating him until he can't move while shouting his accusatory words back at him. But she's interrupted by the Legion version of herself, and has a brief Superman 3 moment while she tries to escape from herself, and ends up running into Julie. Suze tries to warn Julie of the murderer, but Julie responds, by kissing her. And Susie is liking it. At least until the point that Julie stabs her in the stomach. Because she says it's the only way that she can be happy. This causes Susie to wake up screaming. Which is unfortunate because she was apparently in the middle of class. That's embarrassing. To chill out, Susie goes out by the dumpsters for a smoke, running into Jeff Johansson again, and they discuss how they're both artists, like Julie, taking a moment to appreciate each other's works. Jeff doesn't understand how someone as nice as Susie could hang out with someone as cold, uncaring, and mean as Julie, who deliberately refuses to learn Jeff's name. That's when Susie explains that Julie is everything Susie wishes she could be. Someone who's not held back by all the things that make Susie feel she needs to be nice to people. Just unbridled emotion, pure rage, a feral frenzy. That brings us back to the present, as Julie is captured in the store. Susie starts to try and talk the guy down, but Frank has another idea. He pulls out his switchblade as he sneaks up behind the guy and stabs him in the neck. The guy falls over, almost instantly dead, but it's not over yet. Frank realizes this is something they must all share in, so he hands the knife to Julie so that she can leave her own mark on the poor dead guy. I have to pause here to say that I'm not a big fan of Snook's art. The wavy lines, the weird proportions, the lack of detail, none of it impresses me a whole lot. But whatever you think of it, I think it works so well in this scene. As we're further blurring that line between the Dream Legion and the Real World Legion, Snook's use of strange, claustrophobic angles give this segment such a powerful, surreal feel to it that really makes it hit. Joey and Susie, as always, are a little more reluctant to join in on the action. Joey caves first, allowing himself to sever ties to his old family and join this new one. And his rage finally releases as he stabs the corpse repeatedly. That leaves only Susie, who is freaking out and not wanting to participate in this sick game. But Julie knows just what to do, and she joins hands with Susie, and they sink the knife in together. Interestingly enough, this does contradict the established lore. In the game, there's a short video showing this same first kill in the store. But there, only Frank and Julie are seen participating in the attack, while Susie and Joey just watch on in horror. But I like it this way more, with them all participating, all being initiated into the monster that the Legion is to become. From there they flee town, setting up camp, literally, at the Mount Ormond Resort. Frank and Julie begin making plans for what to do next, but as they do, an extremely thick fog rolls in. Frank thinks he sees something moving in the fog, so he takes out his knife and heads into the fog to investigate. When he doesn't return, Julie insists they go looking for him. Susie is again the most reluctant, so she's left behind until she can't take it anymore. Suddenly, the others return, wearing their default mask from the game. Except Julie, who is wearing a variant. Julie attempts to hand Susie her mask, repeating the words from Susie's dream earlier that this is the only way that she can be happy. Something seems to finally snap in Susie, and she confesses her love for Julie, but realizes that Julie always knew how she felt. The four embrace, promising Susie that she'll never be alone, as the fog takes them into the Entity's realm, and takes us into the breakdown.
Maybe it's just because I'm such a big fan of the game, but I really liked this series. Not that I don't have problems with it. Like I said earlier, I'm definitely not a big fan of Snook's art style. But the art definitely doesn't kill this series. I think that's at least in part thanks to Emilio Lecce's coloring work, which does a great job of matching the looks from the game. But where this creative team really excels is with their use of the entity as a background character. The way creepy eyes dot the backgrounds or spidery limbs reach for them at important moments goes such a long way of making it feel like the entity is always surveilling them, always waiting to pull them into its realm at the right moment. Its presence haunts this series so perfectly, in a way that feels so true to form for the series and makes this so uniquely Dead by Daylight. My biggest disappointment is that the series is only four issues, and not just because I wanted more. I mean, I get why they did it. Four Legion members, four issues, each highlighting their own point of view. It makes sense. And with licensed properties, it's entirely possible Behavior had some hand in determining that that's what would happen. But it still feels wrong that the foursome killed one time and then were drawn into the fog. They should have had a proper nightmare origin. There should have been a fifth issue, an issue of the Legion, now as one, going on a proper killing spree and starting their legend. With that issue ending with them probably running from the cops and escaping only by being drawn into the Entity's realm. That we don't get that is disappointing, but I guess I shouldn't hold it against this series that it's not something other than what it tried to be. So I'm giving this series a recommendation level of... Medium. I think it's a great first comic to expand the world of Dead by Daylight, and fans of the game will probably enjoy it. And horror movie fans I think could also appreciate the mood, atmosphere, and basic story which should all be familiar to them. But I don't think it'll have too wide an appeal beyond that unfortunately, so I can't give it a high recommendation. The collected edition gets... 1. Best Girl Susie Mask it should be obvious that that's a good thing. The collection comes with all four issues and a massive cover gallery including some alternates shown between issues. And it also includes a great little script to page breakdown showing the comic creation process. Also, if you get the physical edition, you get a code for an in-game charm featuring the J. Lee alternate cover for the first issue. I mean, I don't super care about the charms, but that's still a pretty cool little bonus. It would have been cooler to get a code for the knife used in this comic that's not in the game, but, you know, I'll take what I can get. Thanks everybody for watching and happy Halloween! Hard to believe that spooky season is already over. I for one am sad to see it go. That means we're getting back to some other videos, which should include some more New 52, and then probably on to some more X-Men again. So if you've enjoyed this video, or if you're interested in what's to come, or if you're just feeling the entity getting its hooks into you, then be sure to like, subscribe, and all those things so that you can help the channel out. And so you can help yourself to be sure to be here next time, and I hope to see you then, right here in the Comic Cave.